Well, welcome indeed. It is so good to have you here joining our Hillsong service today. Listen, first, straight up, for all the mums out there, happy Mother's Day. We are so hoping that you are uh, being celebrated and being looked after. Maybe there's been breakfast in bed or who knows what it's been on, but hey, hopefully you're enjoying the day with some loved ones. Listen, why I wanted to jump in right at the start. It's obviously been a big week for us here at Hillsong Church and we had communicated out to uh, our church this week uh, that the news that Pastor Brian, our global senior pastor, has resigned. He stepped down from his role as global senior pastor and it's been obviously been a big shock for many. Uh, as our interim global senior pastor, who is uh, Phil and Lucinda Dooley, uh, mentioned this week, it's a time of humble reflection for us. And it's a time where we're just looking at us as a church and figuring out, hey, how do we want to continue to get better? Um, and so look at, look at who we are and how we're going to get through this together, church, together. And so listen, with heavy hearts, it's obviously a big week, but I know even across today with Mother's Day, absolutely a part of it. We're going to worship Jesus. We're going to listen uh, to the word and we're going to receive uh, life transforming, uh, incredible good news today for us. And so church, we love you. Uh, if you did miss the news, if you didn't receive an email, we are in the middle of a database transfer. And so go back in your inbox, try and click onto the new one so that you can receive the news in coming weeks and days, because we will be communicating more about this in the days to come. Love you, church. Come on. Why don't we get around the worship, get ready for the word of God. God's going to do something great in our hearts today. Amen.
need we surrender so we re surrender if you're calling we're coming we're not walking we're running god we need we surrender so we re surrender if you're calling we're coming we're not walking we're running god we need we surrender Amen. We love to worship God. And so this is the time of a part of our service when we are going to pray over the needs. There are many of you that have put needs in and requests. And we're living in difficult times. We want to lift every need. Whatever you're facing, we're going to pray this morning. Whether that's financial breakthrough you need or healing in your body, let's pray together. Amen. So Father, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your people. We ask that God, those that are going through, Lord, we pray that you'll remind them and give them your peace, Holy Spirit. We ask that God, you will be a provider, Father, for those that need breakthrough in relationships, restoration, God. For those that need jobs, Holy Spirit, be God in everyone's situation. Resolve issues that we're facing, God. We want to say thanks to your people, that you are God, that you are strong in our lives, and we give everything to you, commit it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Happy Mother's Day. Yes. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you. Oh, thank you. I hope yeah. you're treating her. Hannah really well today. Oh, you know me, of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> and happy Mother's Day to all you mothers, whether you're new mothers, grandmothers, sisters, aunties, happy Mother's Day. Yeah. We hope that you're um, having a wonderful time, breakfast in bed. I remember the days when my kids were little and the breakfast would be a bit, but we still <laughs> love it, we still love it. So we have a beautiful treat for you mothers today. So uh, check out this video. It's definitely feisty. <laughs> Generous and <laughs> always right, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Probably extroverted, I'd say. That's gonna be an interesting answer. <laughs> um, caring. Sacrificial. She was always there. Pretty, funny, kind. Protect, overprotective. Just a great person to be around, especially when you're sad. What words would you use to describe me? Am I miserable? Am I happy? Sad. Uh, happy. I'm happy. Anything else? No. No. Just happy. 
I would be like my mum, because just the way she's disciplined and is always hard working and always wants to strive to be better, yeah. My mum being a single mum, she was always very determined that we were going to get by and that we were going to... We were just going to do well. Mum is like my best friend, and I wish that I can be a mum like she is. The lesson my mum's taught me is just not to lie. Learn that the hard way. My mum's taught me about integrity, standing for the things that you believe in. My mum um, usually says, stop it, or like, do I have to split you up? <laughs> when I ask, oh, please, can I have £80 for a toy? She says, no! Do you think money goes on trees? Although it kind of does, because money is made of little paper, and paper comes from trees, so... My mum repeats herself a lot. She will tell the same story several times and think it's the first time she's ever said it. <laughs> Whenever we need anything, like, she'll be the first person I call. I'm like, oh, mum, I need this, and she's always there. She used to tuck me in when I was little. Oh, I absolutely loved that. She's really nice. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, yeah, she buys me nice clothes. Yeah, she yeah. buys me <laughs> nice clothes and no. shoes. Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day! Woo! Happy Mother's Day! 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 How does your mom make you laugh? <laughs> um... Probably when she dances. When you dance, I end up laughing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got some good moves. Some. Some. Okay, that was amazing. We yeah. love celebrating all of the, the mums in church. But Nikki, go ahead, tell us what else is coming up in all Love right. Church. So Easter, right? We yes. love our Easter eggs, and yes. right now we're all and in Jesus. that 40 day, and <laughs> Jesus. We're doing that 40 day fast. So whatever you've been fasting, and whatever you may have, some of us are fasting, some of us are adding something. I know I've been adding something. I don't know what Rich has been doing, but I hope that you have, and how you're getting along with that. So we're coming up, uh, we're in the days of Lent, but we're coming up to Resurrection Sunday soon. Amen. But on Friday the 15th, we do have online services. Do um, gather with people, groups, teams, and, and watch the service online, and then be sure to be in the room in your location on the Resurrection Sunday, which is gonna be an amazing day for us to celebrate, and also to break fast and to, yeah, just remember what this is all about, um, that he died and rose again, amen. Amen, well, let me take a moment now and encourage us around our giving. And I just wanna read a quick scripture from the book of John, and it says like this, but to all who believe in him and accepted him, he gave them the right to become children of God. They are reborn not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. I have four children, uh, four beautiful children, and one thing we love to do in our house is to host people. If you come to my house, then we're gonna make everything look spick and span, or well, the best we can with four kids, and we're gonna cook you the best food that we can, and we wanna host you and give you an amazing experience, because we want you to feel like a guest. And when you walk in, I hope that you feel amazing, loved, well looked after. But if you're my family, there's a sense of responsibility that we are all in this together, that this is our responsibility to care for the people that are coming into our home. And here's the thought I'd love to drop into your hearts today. Do you view church as being a guest or a family member? You see, an amazing truth is that Jesus said that we are now children of God. We belong to him. He is our spiritual father. And we all now, not only as individuals, but as a unit, have a collective responsibility for building his 
house. If you are a guest here today and you're checking us out, we will do everything we can to make you feel welcome and at home. But if this is your home and you call yourself a child of God, I want to encourage you with this sense of great responsibility that we all chip in together, we all find our place and we all make a contribution to make this home feel special for those that we're trying to reach. That's one of the greatest motivations I think that we can have as believers, as children of God, about why we continue to give of an important aspect of our lives, including finances and serving and all that kind of stuff. I hope you've been encouraged today and there is a QR code and a whole bunch of different ways that you can get connected with giving on the screen now. But before I hand back over to Nikki, let me just pray for you and then we'll carry on. Father, I want to thank you for every single person in this church who's hearing this message right now, who calls themselves a child of God, who said that this is my home. Father, we pray a blessing over them as a family and as an individual. And Father, as they trust and put you first, we're praying that they would experience your blessing and peace in the area of finance in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as we have already talked about, it is Mother's Sunday and we've got a phenomenal message coming up. We know it's going to encourage all of the women in our church, but not only that, but every single person who's going to be joining us for the service today. Here is Nicola to share the word with us. Well, hello church, well, hello to everyone watching in from all the locations across the UK. I love you. And of course it's been said already, but a huge happy Mother's Day. I hope all of you mums feel totally spoiled and loved on. Of course, we're celebrating all the women of our church. You are phenomenal and amazing. And I count it such a privilege to be bringing the word of God today. And so today I am going to be bringing a message called Mother's Mess and miracles, mother's mess and miracles. I feel like they all go hand in hand. Motherhood definitely has some mess associated with it. Any mums out there, any parents out there, you'll agree with me, the house is never the same. There is mess, you leave the house sometimes and come home and feel like you've been burgled because the house has been in carnage from just leaving with all of the children around the place. There is mess when it comes to our sleep routines, thinking, dear Lord Jesus, will I ever have a full night's sleep again? There's mess with attitudes and temper tantrums, usually in public places. And of course, the mess of our cars and the sheer terror when someone asks for a lift home because you know what the back seat of your car looks like. There is a lot of mess with motherhood, but there's also amazing miracles. I'll never forget the first time that I held my daughter, Leela, in my arms. I just, I remember feeling this is such an incredible miracle. I don't know how people don't believe in God in this moment. And the miracle of just watching them grow up and walk and talk and get their own little feelings and thoughts and their own characters start to develop. So many incredible messes and miracles. But isn't that just the nature of life? The highs and the lows, the mountaintops and the valley seasons, the messes that we navigate through the different situations of life, but always trusting God that he is faithful and that he does do incredible miracles in and through our lives. So today, as we journey together through this message, we're going to actually look at the life of two mums. That is Sarah and Hagar and their beautiful story of messes and miracles. But I'm going to give up. God is going to speak to you right where you are at today. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to get into the word of God. So Father, I thank you so much that you promise that you watch over your word in order that it is fulfilled, Lord God. And so Father, we open our hearts and our minds that you would speak to us and do what only you can do. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. So the first P that we're going to look at today is purpose. Purpose. So as we go through this story, you'll see Sarai, Sarah, Abram, Abraham. It might be a bit confusing, but they're actually all one and the same people. They are. They, God changes their name halfway through the story. So here we find Sarah in the pages of scripture in Genesis 12. Why don't we read it along together? It says, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your nation, your country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to this land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make you famous. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those that bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed 
as the Lord had instructed. He trusted him to go out. And here we find Sarah in verse 5. He took his wife, Sarah. Here we have Sarah, her husband, just minding their business, living the simple life, and God comes into the frame and calls them out of everything they knew into this wild, grand adventure full of his plans, full of his purposes. He didn't really give them all the specifics of what was going to happen. They just had to rely on God to trust him and follow him. I think that's exactly where we find ourselves in our relationship with God. We're called out of everything that we know and thrust into a come follow me, trust me. I've got amazing plans and purposes and we don't have all the specifics. We don't know what A, B, C, D and E is going to look like. We just have to follow knowing that he is faithful to what he calls us to. And I think God's actually very intentional not giving us all the specifics to the journey. I think two things. If he did one thing, we potentially could be terrified. Be like, heck no, we're not doing this. God, I don't think I could do what you're calling me to. The journey looks a little bit too rough terrain for me to go on. And so we bow out before we've even begun. That's probably more like my story. But also, potentially, when if we knew everything that was going to happen, we might think, okay, well, this is what's, what God's calling me to. Let's make it happen now. And we circumvent the actual journey, the process that God needs to take us on. And so here we are. We find that Sarai and Abraham, they are on this journey of trust into the unknown. I wonder what things, when it comes to our lives, that we, the journeys we take, the processes we have to go on in order for us to learn lessons that you could never read in a book or read in the Bible And actually, it's only by living them that we learn the lessons. For me, there's things like those verses where it says that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That God, he gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding. Those verses are amazing, but I have only had them become revelation to me because I have experienced fear. I only know God to be healer, not just because I've read it, but because I've seen it in my life, my family. I've told this story before, but I could have been an orphan at six months old because my parents had the most horrific car accident and should have died, but God is a healer. And so there are lessons I have learned only because I have lived and traversed the journey. And I think so often we can want our journey or the process to living out and walking out life with God to be smooth sailing and trouble free. I mean, that would be wonderful, but unfortunately Jesus tells us, hey, that's not the way it's going to go. In this world, there's going to be trouble, but he tells us, be of good cheer because I've overcome and you're going to have victory. So I just want to say today, don't despise the process. Don't despise the unknown, even when you don't know the specifics of what's coming, because ultimately God uses the process to prepare us, to train us, and to equip us of what he is calling us to. I love in James 1 verse 2, it says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I love that in the process, God is training us and equipping us and empowering us, saying you're going to be mature, complete, not lacking anything. You see, the process is just a setup for where God is taking us. And so often I think we can wonder, God, what are you, what are you calling me to? What is it that, I, that you have got for me? We can worry about our future. Who am I? Why am I here? Have, or am I making the right decisions for my future? But can I just say, especially young people, this is a big question. Can I just say relax? Tell the person next to you, relax. You, we need to relax because the word of God, it tells us that we are not to worry about tomorrow because tomorrow it worries about itself. But ultimately, we don't need to know what's happening in a year, what's happening in five years, what's happening in 10 years, and know all of the journey, because ultimately we have today, and his mercy is for us today. And I want to just say, if we are good stewards of what we have today, that we're making sure our heart's right today, that we're inviting the Holy Spirit into the decisions we're making today, that we're asking for his fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, judgment, self-control, all of these amazing things, today, then you will look through the journey of your life and seeing all of the todays where his mercy was, he's going to take you on this grand wild adventure that you never could have imagined. You know, that's the story of my life. I never could have imagined (laughs) 
that I would be here right now. In fact, I would have run away from it. I was the girl who used to vomit every time I had to public speak. I was the girl who got asked to say, why do you love Jesus in a church service and hid in the bathroom because I was too terrified that they would get me up. I was the girl who said I never wanted to be in ministry because I'd been so close to church and see that it's very messy. But God, just me trusting day by day, little by little, step by step, it's amazing to see that his journey of training and preparing and equipping and my heart becoming his heart. And that is how the journey of life happens when we don't know all the specifics. Don't despise the process. Lean into the process and you find his goodness and his grace. And that is what Abraham and Sarah did. They encountered God's protection. They encountered God's blessing. And he comes again in Genesis 15 verse 4 after he had called them out from everything they'd known and he gives them another promise. He says this, This man, talking about their slave who was going to inherit everything, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is from your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Then God took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. Indeed, you, indeed, if indeed you can count them, then he said, so shall your offspring be. You know, this was an incredible incredible purpose that he had, one that was beyond their imagination. And I think so often God is going to take us to places that we can't. Ephesians 3, 22, Ephesians 3, 20, he says that we are going to see exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask, think or imagine, but it takes us stepping out into the unknown, choosing calling over comfort, choosing his purposes over our plans. The next P in this story is the problem. So God has given this, them this amazing, amazing calling. They've stepped out in faith. But then Sarah, she has a problem because there's a tension between the reality of the promise and actually what she is navigating in the natural. And she is a woman who it says in the Bible is past childbearing years. So it literally is impossible for her to have a child of her own. And so she does what so many of us do. When we're looking at the situations and circumstances around us, maybe finding the one, the one, maybe with our finances, maybe health challenges or relationships, and we're figuring out, I don't know how this is all going to work, but we kind of take it into our own hands to figure it out in our own strength. And that is where Sarah is found, helping God out to make sure that his promises come to pass in her life. And so she tries to produce an heir the only way that she knows possible. In ancient times, I mean, it's very countercultural to what we would have now, but ancient times, if you were unable to provide an heir as a wife, you could provide your servant to bear a child on your behalf, and that child would be seen by the whole community as your child as well as your husband's. And that was an heir that could go on and have a legacy, and all of your descendants would come from this child. And that was a feasible plan. And Sarah's like, okay, God, this is a plan can't quite make it happen the way you've said, so I'm going to just try plan B. But you know, God was always authoring a different story. And the greater problem here wasn't the natural circumstances. It was actually Sarah's trust and reliance in God. Would she trust God that he was actually able to do what he said he would do? And through Sarah's striving to try and come up with the answer herself, There is a lot of mess, as we see later on in this story. She actually provides a lot of grief and pain, not only for herself, but for those around her, because she tried to bypass God in it and produced a mess rather than just lay hold of his miracle. Today, I just wonder what problems maybe that you're facing, maybe situations that you're like, I don't know how this is going to work out and navigate Because so often we're trying to carry the things that God is saying, hey, would you cast your cares on me? Because I care for you. That we're actually not meant to carry them on our own. We're very much like my daughter, Alani, who is now eight, but she once was a very sassy, stubborn little toddler. And um, have a look at this video, because I think it very easily um, can be how we sometimes are towards God. Can mommy help? Mommy, help you, it's heavy. Mommy, help. Just happy. You happy? Yeah, and there's nothing. It's too hard. 
As you saw, mummy, no helping. There she is carrying the most humongous thing as a little kid. And if you don't see on that video, literally a few seconds later, she trips and falls and has a bloody knee and arm because she would not relinquish control. But how often are we like that with the things that we're navigating in life? We're holding on to them and God has his arm outstretched saying, hey, I want to help you with that. We need to remember that God just isn't the initiator of the plan. He's there to guide us, to sustain us, to help us along the way, that he is the one, what he starts, he will complete. All Sarah had to do was to trust God, that he was faithful to his word and not try and solve the problem in her own strength. Can I just say one thing before we finish this point about trusting God with our problems? Is that it's not a passive thing. We can think, okay, great, I just have to sit back and wait for God to show up and all my problems will get solved. We can sit there maybe eating the Ben and Jerry's and watching Netflix and just waiting for the one to slide into our DMs on Instagram or to fall in, into our world and be like, there she is, there is the one. Maybe we are just waiting there, buying things on ASOS or playing PlayStation, just waiting for the keys to our dream home to, to fall into our lap. But no, waiting on God for our problems, the things that are got, we're navigating in the world. It's not a passive thing. In fact, in Psalm 37, verse 23, it says this, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their life, every single detail. He is concerned about them. But it's how does he direct us? It's in our steps. It's in our walking. It's in our moving forward. It's not in our sitting still and being stagnant. He moves when we move. That we would, like I was talking about before, that we would ask him in our day to day, God, what is it you'd have me do today? What is your wisdom for me today? What is your peace for me today? That it's in the moving forward, in the action of continuing to trust him and walk with him, that we see him come to his faithfulness over every single one of our problems. The third P that we face that Sarah and Hagar also was facing in this story was presence, the presence of God. Their story continues with Hagar getting pregnant and we talked about Sarah, she actually instigated this plan. This was her idea, but this plan actually starts to be a source of much pain to her and she starts to be jealous of Hagar who is now pregnant with her child and she starts to mistreat her, the Bible says. She says she treats her so badly that Hagar ends up running away. You know, I love the Bible because Hagar, her name literally means flight. She literally took flight from her situation, a situation that she probably had no say in. She was just being an obedient servant, doing what she was told, and here she found being mistreated for her obedience. She was in pain. She was grieving. She was asking questions. She was disappointed. She was frustrated. All of these things, she runs away to the wilderness to a place called Shur. Now, Shur, I love the Bible again, Hebrew words. It actually literally means wall. When her back was against a wall, and she was like, I don't see a way out of this. I need to get out of here. I need to run. She found herself in this place of the wilderness. I wonder if any of people watching on in locations right now online, if you find yourself maybe feeling like your back's against the wall, you don't see a clear answer. You don't see a way out. Maybe you're having questions and pain and disappointments. But you know, this is exactly where Hagar was in this story. She was in the wilderness and this is where God's presence finds her. Right there, when she thought she was running away, that's where God's presence is. His attention, his kindness, and his presence comes to meet her. Genesis 16, verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, son of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Right there in the midst of all of her troubles and heartache, he finds her and says, hey, babe, what's going on? What's happening? Why are you here? What happened? Why, what are you going to do from here? And, you know, we all know God is a God who is all-knowing. He knew the answer to all of these questions. But yet he asked her to give her an opportunity to unburden her heart. In, in essence, God was giving her the opportunity to lament. Now, lament, that's a big Bible word. 
And if I'm honest, it's a bit of a scary word because when I first think of lamenting, I think of the prophets and how they lamented. And if you look in the Bible, the, the prophets had some weird and wonderful ways of lamenting. Micah 1 verse 8, this was Micah lamenting for the people of God. It said, therefore, I will mourn and lament. I will walk around barefoot and naked, howl like a jackal and moan like an owl. Like, if that's what lamenting is, then no, thank you, I'm okay. I don't think it's going to be very helpful. I think we might all get arrested if we ascribe to walking around barefoot, naked, howling like jackals and moaning like owls. But actually, if you look at the essence of what lamenting means in the Bible, it's beautiful and it's so very necessary. You see, lamenting is all through the Bible. It's a third of all of the Psalms. Jesus, in fact, laments just before he goes to the cross. Lamenting is just a form of prayer. It's an invitation of God to bring all of our concerns, all of our pain, all of our disappointment, and to come to him and say, hey, God, I'm coming to you with this, all with the purpose of restoring and renewing our confidence and trust in him. And this is where Hagar finds herself. Psalm 13 is actually a psalm of lament that King David wrote And it gives us four really great stepping stones of what a lament has within it. Firstly, for us all, figuring out different things. And I want to say, if you're in a mountaintop and everything in life is good, then you might think, okay, I don't need this right now, but maybe just write down some notes because life is a roller coaster. There will be seasons where you're navigating some things and these might come in useful. But the first thing that we do when it's a lament is we actually turn to God It's an addressing of God. It's in our pain and confusion and the things that we're navigating in life of saying, instead of having a distance between God, instead of running from him, I'm choosing with my heart to turn to him in my pain. And that's what David did. He addresses God, how long, O Lord? Turn to God is the first thing. The second thing it, it does when we lament is to bring our complaint. It's to be honest, vulnerable, raw, and say, here is the deal, God. These are my frustration. This is my concern. This is what is going on. It is being authentic before him, bringing our complaint. The third thing that you find in the Psalm 13 is that the next step is that you ask God for help. That we don't just become disillusioned and go, this is it. I don't know what's going to happen, but actually we ask God for help. We invite him into our situation and say, God, I trust that you actually can do something about this. And so I'm asking you to intervene. And then the last step of lamenting, which all roads point to, the reason why we do it is that finally we choose to trust. It's a choice. It's a decision of our heart. It's a choice to go, God, I trust your character. God, I trust your promises. God, I trust that you turn all things together for good. And I don't know how this is going to work out. And I don't know how you're going to turn it all around for good. But I choose to trust you. Psalm 13 verse 5, this is what David does. He says, and I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. And Hagar, she finds this place where God's saying, hey, just tell me what's going on, babe. What's, What's happening in your heart? And she experiences the tangible presence of God. Genesis 16, verse 9, it says, Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you you more descendants than you can count. He gave her a promise. And then the angel said, But you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. What a beautiful thing that in this moment, she finds God's peace, she finds his promise, and she finds the perseverance to go back and to walk out this road that God had called for her. And in this mix of just experiencing God's presence, it changes her situation completely. And in verse 13, Hagar, she says this, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God that sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Isn't this beautiful? 
She didn't just say, I've heard about a God who's faithful, or maybe there is someone out there that can help me, but she said, I have encountered, I have experienced for myself the one who is close, the God who is not distant and aloof and off doing his own thing, but no, the one who comes close, who is attentive and kind, and the God who sees me and he acts and he is faithful. And so I just want to say to us, church, That no matter what we're navigating in different seasons, and maybe it will be a different season later, but you could remember back to this message, that it is a powerful thing to turn to God. It is a powerful thing to come before him with our complaints, to ask him for help. And maybe with everything happening in the world right now, that we come to him. Maybe as a church, what we're going through as a church community, that some of these things we can be putting into action. Maybe it's something individually you're going through, a health challenge. Maybe it's financial. I'm also very mindful on Mother's Day for mothers in waiting who are believing for their own child and the pain of today. I would just say to you, ask God for help. Turn to him. Go to the position where you trust him that he is faithful to turn all things together for good because he is a God, it says in Ecclesiastes, that writes beautiful stories. He turns everything beautiful in its time. The fourth thing about this story as we continue is that now Sarah and Hagar, they both have promises. Hagar has a promise to go back to. Sarah has a promise. But now they have to be patient. They have to be patient for and wait for God to arrive and it to come to fruition. I don't know about you, but I'm not a very patient person. I don't love being patient. I go to the tube and if there's anything more than two or three minutes up on that board, like seven or heaven forbid, 12 minutes I have encountered, my patience is a little worn thin. We want everything now. We want to swipe our Amazon and see that thing on our doorstep the next day. And if things aren't now, then we think something's wrong and we need to put something into action, just as Sarah did. And we saw what a mess that made. But I want to remind us, church, that God's delays are not God's denials. God's delays are not his denials, that God is faithful to every single one of his promises. And as the story of Sarah continues in Genesis 18, three messengers, they come to Abraham and Sarah. And it says in verse 10, then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife will have a son. Now, Sarah, she was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, it says here. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed at herself as she thought, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? I love this moment. Sarah's literally hiding in a tent, ears dropping, and she totally gets busted, laughing in disbelief that how am I, who she was a 90-year-old woman at this stage, going to have a baby? I am past the childbearing years, but even in her disbelief, God reconfirms the promise to her. And he says, is anything too hard for the Lord? I want to ask you, you today, Is that the conviction of your heart? Do you believe that nothing is impossible for God? There is no challenge. There is nothing too complex. There is nothing out of the realm of possibilities for our God. Because if that is not the conviction of your heart, then this is a faith issue. And I want to talk about faith for a moment because faith, I think so often we can get wrong. We can think of we need more faith. I just need more faith and then God can come through. I need to conjure up more faith and believe more and believe harder and then it will be okay. But that is not faith. Faith is absolutely not about the quantity or the quality of our faith. It's all about who or what we put our faith in. If we want more faith, actually all we need to do is get to know the source of our faith better, Jesus Christ. Can I give you an analogy to help understand this? Just imagine a chair. Like when we sit down in a chair, we're trusting that chair to hold our weight, to not fall, to not crumble beneath us, but for us to be able to rest there safely and firmly. Now, just imagine a chair that is made of cardboard and is held together with sticky tape. No matter how much I trust that chair to hold my weight, my faith is going to fail because the object of my faith is not strong. 
But think about a chair that is strong. It has been built to stand the test of time. Even if I do not believe that it has the strength to hold me, if I would just trust and rest in it, I will find that that chair is trustworthy because it is the object of my faith and it is strong. You see, the more we get to know God, the more we get to see he is reliable and trustworthy and faithful and for us, the more that we can depend on him. You see, our, if our perception of God is flawed, then our faith is going to be flawed. And so we find ourselves in this place asking ourselves, like Genesis 18 verse 4 says, is anything too hard for God? That word hard, pala in Hebrew, it means hard, difficult, but it also means wonderful and extraordinary. And I wonder for you today if you, if the conviction of your heart would be, if, is anything too extraordinary, too wonderful for God to do in my life? Because me, I have walked with God for 34 years and it is the conviction of my heart absolutely that nothing is too hard. Nothing is impossible for God. And I want to invite you today, if that is not your conviction, just to get to know the object of your faith, just to get to know the source of your faith, Jesus Christ, better. Because as you walk with him, as you traverse life with him, he will show his goodness, his grace, and his faithfulness towards you. Our faith in God, the God of the impossible, allows us to be patient. It allows us to wait because we know that he is faithful and he never will fail us. The last thing, as we're about to close today, the fifth P, I hope you're still with me, is the promise. Now, this is the part of the sermon that we're excited for. I hate movies that end badly. I can't stand them. Don't want, to, don't want anything to do with them. I will always want a happy ending. And of course, there is a happy ending to this story because God is faithful to all of his promises. But I just wanted to say, before we get to the happy ending, we just need to circle back a little bit to something that's very, very significant. We spoke earlier about Sarai becoming Sarah, Abram becoming Abraham, because God changes their name as part of calling them out, of part of being a part of God's plans and purposes. He changes their name. Now, in the Hebrew language, which is what the Old Testament was originally written in, you can probably see on the screen, there's the name Abram and Sarai. Now, when God changes their name in Hebrew, he puts into their name one letter, both of them, the same exact letter. And it's the letter in Hebrew called Hey. Hey, easy to remember. Now that letter, every, every letter in the Hebrew language, it has a number associated with it. And so this letter has the numerical value of five. Now, if you know what biblical meanings of number means, five has the meaning of grace. So we're going to list these things. So hey, what God puts into their name, firstly, it, ha it is associated with grace. Secondly, it's associated this letter, hey, with the spirit of God. Every single time it has to do with the divine breath or spirit of God. And thirdly, something very significant about this letter, the first time that we ever see this letter in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, it is in association with creation, that which was formless and empty. God's spirit, his grace, it brings into creation that, what, that what, which was not. He speaks and things form and are created. So why are we talking about all of this? Well, if you think about their story, Abram and Sarah, they're called to see more descendants than they can ever imagine, that all people are going to be blessed through them, that they're going to have a child at 100 years old and 90 years old, absolute impossibility, but in their own strength, in their own name, this is completely impossible. But when God comes into the mix, he changes their name. He adds something extra to who they are. His hey, his spirit of God, his grace upon them, his creative power that where there is emptiness and void, he is able to create something. It was never about them. It was always about God. It's exactly the same with our journey, our plans, our purposes, all that he has for us, that he calls us out and he changes our name. We become children of God and he puts his hay, his spirit. It says when we become Christians, he puts his spirit within us, that it's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. It now lives in us 
and it creates and brings into being all that God has called us to. It's not by might, it's not by power, it is by the Spirit of God. It is not us striving and trying to figure out the promises of God for our lives, that ultimately He is in it all and His Spirit is within us walking every single day to see His promises fulfilled in our lives. And so here we are, the promises about to be fulfilled. Hagar in Genesis 16 verse 10, we saw that promise. God said, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. And if you look through the pages of scripture, you will see a people group called the Ishmaelites who are descendants of Ishmael. God had been faithful to provide a descendants to this son. Then you look at Sarah's story. I love the end of her story in Genesis 21 verse 1. It says that now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised. God gave, Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. Don't you just love this? Because the name Isaac actually means he laughs. And we saw earlier before Sarah, she laughed in disbelief, in the pain of thinking, God, as if that's going to happen, I'm a 90-year-old woman. That promise is not going to come to fruition. She laughed in disappointment and disbelief, but now she held a son whose name means he laughs. And she literally every time calls that name is reminded that God, he turns laughter of sorrow and pain into joy, into the fruition of all of his promises that what he starts, he does complete. What he says, he does do. That all, out of all of the mess, our God makes beautiful miracles. And that is our God. And I want to say, church, no matter what, we are navigating right now, whether we're trying to figure out our future, just go day by day, step by step, trusting him. Whether we are in the waiting period and we just need to actually rely on our faith, not how much faith we have, but the faith in who God is. He is for us and with us. Or maybe it's a time of lamenting and we're bringing us things before him, not turning aside from God, but turning to him because he is faithful. He is a God of his promises and all of his promises are yes and amen. Amen? I love you, church. Well, right now, just before we close, it's actually my privilege to be able to lead every single one of us in a prayer to get to know this God, this beautiful Saviour I have been speaking about. And in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, it actually talks about all the promises of God. They are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. We only access the plans, the purposes, the promises of God through Jesus Christ because there is a disconnect between us and God. You may feel it in this moment. You may not have come into relationship with God because there is, there's sin, there's mess in between, but that's where Jesus came in. That's why in a few weeks in Easter, we're gonna celebrate him going to the cross because he came and died for all of our sins. So anything that is in between us and God, it was dealt with and he said, it is finished. And so right now, there is an opportunity, an invitation from God to come into a relationship and nothing can separate you from his love. It's done for you. All you have to do is accept the finished work of Jesus and say, hey God, I don't wanna keep doing this in my own strength. I wanna live in your purposes, your plans for my life. So I'm going to just say an eternity changing prayer. And I know across all locations that you will be praying this along with me. But say this, dear Jesus, I want to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ every single day for the rest of my life. I ask that you would come in. You would forgive me of my sin. You would wipe the slate clean. I thank you that you have a plan for me, that I don't have to do it on my own, that you love me, that you're for me. So I give you my life today in Jesus' name, amen. And for those of you online who just made that decision, a huge congratulations. We want to celebrate with you. In fact, on the screen right now, there is a QR code, which will take you to a place because as a church, we want to give you a gift. We want to help you in the decision you've made. Maybe in the chat, you can write, I made that decision, but we are so excited for this first step into this journey of living out a relationship with Jesus and we're here for it all. It's always better doing it with a community and you have found one with us and so make sure you reach out because we would love to help you any way that we can. 
So church, thank you again for joining us on Mother's Day. We hope you go out and have the best day celebrating your mums, being around people that you love. And I pray that this week, that there is more sunshine. How amazing has the weather been, by the way? But that God is for us and it blesses us in all that we endeavour to do. So Father, I thank you that you bless your people, that you cause your face to shine upon them. I thank you that in everything that we do, that you go before us. Bless your people, I pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Love you, church. Have the most incredible week.